So hello, my name's Phoenix. I've been setting up eco community centres for about 30 years since the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. Uh, myself and a group of friends got together. It's always a collective of people and a network of people. Got together and we realised that the governments weren't doing enough at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. Um, 179 countries got together and made an agreement, but uh, there were certain things left out by the oil companies about renewable energy and various other things. We got together and realised we needed these spaces and um, we started working to set up community centres. We started by, uh, because we didn't have money, we started squatting buildings and setting up various different eco projects, community centre projects in them. We did try the legal route. Uh, we went to different councils. Uh, apparently Islington Council was going to give, uh, give a building free to a community group. So we went to see Jeremy Corbyn at the time and the other MP, Chris Smith, and we got letters from them to say, support the Rainbow Centre, give us uh, that, that empty building that you're offering Islington Council. Unfortunately, after about nine months of waiting and doing a very basic business plan and doing the best we could, council turned around and said, no, we're not going to give it free to a community group. Uh, we're just going to uh, sell it for a million pound. And we had another kind of black community group that came to work with us. They wanted to create a gym to get young people getting involved, getting them, you know, helping community, getting them out of other things that could have got them into trouble. And we were all going to work together on this Rainbow Community Centre. So anyway, um, we started occupying buildings because we didn't have funds and we took a lot of action. And so roughly, I suppose, for the next 18 odd years, 20 years, we occupied buildings. And we got in, we organised in circles as communities and set up all sorts of talks, workshops, meetings, um, cabarets, performances. People came and set up all different sorts of things from computer recycling rooms to bike recycling to, you know, a whole range. We had space. Um, Phoenix's law of space. If you've got space, it will fill up. And there are so many groups in all of our communities who are really, really, really looking for space to set something up for whatever they want to do. And what's the one thing that we can all see in our communities? Everywhere you look, in many cities across the UK, there are empty buildings. They are an absolute wasted resource. We recycle bottles, cans, plastic, paper. Why aren't we recycling and reusing one of our biggest resources, vacant property, empty buildings? And what I'm going to tell you about over the next hour, I'll probably chat for half an hour and then there'll be 30 minutes questions, is a recipe that has worked in 22 cities across the UK now to get one of those vacant properties that you can see boarded up with metal on the windows, unloved, uncared for. There's a way to legally get those opened up and, and set up a community centre. So, yes, we occupied buildings and squatted for 20 odd years, but for the last seven years we've been doing it legally with not-for-profit companies and with charities to get these empty buildings. And we, in fact, actually helped. Uh, during lockdown, I wrote a handbook called How to Set Up a Climate Emergency Center in 10 Steps. And we put it around a lot of different networks and groups and, and contacts over the last 30 years. And it seemed to be an idea whose time has come because after lockdown, a lot of people wanted community. They wanted to reconnect. They wanted a space to meet, organize, meet other people. And there are now, using this recipe I'm going to tell you about, um, 22 uh, vacant properties now turned into climate emergency centres. They are all autonomous and independent. That's the way we wanted it to be set up, so that everyone runs their things how they want to. But we ask a few things, that they you know, work together to help and support each other, that they're based on kind of mutual aid and trust, that they, they share various different you know, uh, information and resources around each other, that they focus on solutions particularly. Because many of the movements you see here represent the Green Gathering, and we also do something called the Resistance Exhibition over there, charting seven or eight waves of the movement. Now, many of these movements came through the various centres that we set up, from the road protest movement to the um, uh, Reclaim the Streets into the People's Global Action, moving on out into the... Um, you know, the anti-globalization movement, Seattle, Genoa, Prague, all the big international summits, on into the anti-war movement, on into climate justice camps, climate justice movement. They all came to the various centers and said, we need space to meet, to organize, to paint banners, to, to store whatever it was, bike, bicycles to materials to sound systems. 
our communities urgently need these spaces on, on into a kind of occupy and the anti-fracking movement right up to the present day movements you know all of these all of the movements all of these different projects need space to get together um so basically i'm going to tell you a bit about the recipe but one of the things i want to do just a little experiment that we did last year here is a little time travel for one minute i want you to think about what the future is going to be like if we carry on in the way we are going with investing all this money into oil with polluting with you know chopping down the forest with consuming so much and not sharing enough so for one minute i want you to imagine in your mind's eye just for a minute it's going kind of quiet what the world will be like i did this last year and then afterwards we're going to do a minute visualizing what it could be like if we had a lot of the infrastructure of these buildings and land and spaces to create the kind of solutions-based futures we want to see. So if we just close our eyes or however you want to do it for about a minute and just imagine we carry on the way we are going, polluting, destroying, consuming, and, and, and you know, what sort of future are we going to have now? We can start to see it with the wildfires and the, the waters rising. What sort of futures are we going to have if we carry on the way we're going? So just think about it in your mind's eye. For a minute, see those future worlds that us, our children, our grandchildren will be living in. Deserts, waters rising, fires burning, temperatures going up. We can change this. It's not a particularly nice place to go. And we live in a real bubble in the Western world because we are only seeing certain bits of how climate change is affecting us. But actually, there are millions of people starving and being affected by f wildfires and, and, and deserts and, and having to migrate. And that there is massive, you know, massive suffering going on already. And we can change this. We could change our entire system to a way to help each other, help the world, enough food to feed the world, enough empty buildings to house everyone and space for all these projects. So now I just want you to imagine for one more minute, imagine if we had many of these climate emergency centers and, and, and community buildings, not just one, but a whole network of buildings within your town or city that could work on solutions and could get together and help each other and bits of land that were interconnected to them. And we had the time and the energy and the resources and most importantly, the spaces for you to build your dreams of the sustainable futures you want to build. So just for a minute, imagine that, that we've got space, we've got land for all those favorite projects you want to see happen, for renewable energy, for bike repair, for whatever it is you want to do in your community. And you've got an empty building, not just one, but a few, a community center on the high street, a warehouse, a bit of land to grow food. Just imagine that for a, for a minute. And then we'll move into the steps of how we're going to do that. A little time travel. I hope you're starting to glimpse some possible better future timelines and possibilities of what we could do. And I'm going to tell you about the recipe of how we can start to get these spaces. So it's really, really important that we restore, I think there's a well, talk on at the moment about restoring the commons, but these commons, these community centers, we need to reopen these buildings up for our communities. So many were closed down due to austerity, due to cuts, whatever it is. Um, so. There's a recipe, like I say, during lockdown, I wrote a handbook, how to set up a climate emergency center in 10 steps. And, you know, through these physical spaces, we can start to meet in circles and groups and to, to, 
to imagine, to talk about, to discuss, and have the physical spaces to set up these better projects that are gonna help the future. I've seen it through many of these centers for many years. They're kind of like a mothership for hundreds of other projects that come in and use the space. Imagine if your community had a big hall with 15 or 20 rooms off it, that all of your friends and groups in town that could meet and could have a space to do that. So, a little bit about the recipe. Um, I'm a networker, I've been networking for lots of years, and what we're networking is a recipe of how to practically really do this. This isn't a talking shop, this isn't ideas or a vision or a dream off in the future. This is happening now in 22 cities across the UK. They have recycled, repurposed, and reused everything from the, the first climate emergency center in Ilford. We worked very hard as we come out of lockdown to set up and put on all sorts of talks, workshops, second-hand markets, upcycle, recycle things, set up a new transition town, had all sorts of meetings and events and little mini festivals and whatever it was. Very hard to get it going coming out of lockdown, but we did it. And then we did lots of Zooms at that time to many groups across the country. So to tell a few of the, of the stories, like um, uh, Staines was one of the earliest ones. They, the council, so 300 councils have declared climate emergency. Uh, thanks to many of us blocking up the streets for 11 days uh, and really putting the pressure on, on the government, the councils, a climate emergency was declared and 300 councils have, have, have declared. But the next step, they need to do something. So there's a recipe of how basically if you set up a not-for-profit company or a community interest company or a charity, and it is, I think, possible also for a co-op if it's not-for-profit, not all of these legal entities need to be not-for-profit, there is a way that if it's a private owner, you can save them up to 100% on the business rates. Um, and if it's a council, sometimes they'll give you a building. So what we do, just uh, I'll explain that in a bit, but what, what we do is many groups around the country get in touch with us, with the Climate Emergency Network, and say, you know, we'd like to set up a team or a group in our area. We'd like to find an empty building. So we generally arrange a Zoom a month ahead, and we get 15, 20, 30 people that come to that Zoom. And they are, I did one recently for uh, a group in uh, Durham, a group in rugby. There were 35 people on the Durham one, including two councillors. There was the head of the green, uh, green department of the council uh, and another councillor. And we explained, you know, this is what we do and we help groups set up. They set up a legal entity, uh, not for profit. They identify an empty building. We help them through this process to set a legal entity up or whatever. And they then identify the empty building. If it's owned by a private owner, then you fill out a form called the discretionary business rates form. A lot of the property industry has known about this for years, but they don't tell most people. And we put it into a handbook, put it out around lots of networks to lots of people. So basically, you fill out discretionary business rates form for that empty old school that's been sat there for five years that's empty. And you... If it's privately owned, you save them up to 100% on the business rates. Sometimes the owner will give you a charitable donation back to your group to set up. So sometimes your group might get five, 10, 15, 20,000 pound as a seed fund to set up your new project. Um, if it's a council building, council, it doesn't always work that on the, on the rates thing, but the council will give you the building. Sometimes, like in Staines, they've given some money to help set it up. Um, so. By doing that, you, you, you get the building by something called a meanwhile lease. That means you use the building in the meanwhile before they do something else with it. So it might be in two, three, four, five years, they're going to turn it into something else. We're hoping that all of these centres become longer term things with community benefit societies and community land trusts and things like that. But for the moment, you're getting a building for one, two, three, four years to do, bring together an alliance of groups. So that's partly what the Zoom does. My job is to get people excited get them realize this is possible, it's happening in 22 other cities. So we do a Zoom, and they bring together an amazing mix of people. There's people from Friends of the Earth, from Transition Towns, from XR, from Greenpeace, from the Women's Institute, from the Wildlife Local Group, from the Youth Group, from the Faith Group, from the Women's Group, from the different cultural groups, arts groups, come together in this Zoom. And half of them might know each other already, but the other half don't. And suddenly they realize there's this alliance that could begin to form if they had a space. And that's part of what the Climate Emergency Centre project is about, is to build alliances locally and give them a physical space. Because we need to cooperate across the spectrum of our society, everybody, from all different walk of life, from all different you know, areas. We urgently need to cooperate very, 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 very fast. We are reaching all of the tipping points, you know, from the ice is melting to the forest being chopped down to, you know, 
temperatures are rising. And these are climate emergency centers, but they're also climate solution centers. And what's amazing about them is that they actually reach out onto the high street to people who aren't usually in this, whatever you want to call us, the alternative green environmental scene. You get Joe and Jane public wandering past on the way back from work or home, or wherever it is, and they come in and they see stuff that a lot of us see at things like the Green Gathering. So they will see, you know, example, some of the centers, people go in, there's a veggie vegan cafe, there's a, there's a kids area, there's, a, there's a, a zero waste shop, there's electric bikes and transport ideas, um, you know, there's displays about the local rivers and the environment, there's a stage, a little space where they can have a bit of music or a talk or a speaker. There's sometimes some of them have got a display on renewable energy or insulation or whatever it is. And there is space for meetings, talks, workshops, music, entertainment. Any group in town can come and ask to use the space. All of these things for years, we run them on a sliding scale. So groups that have got more money can pay more, groups with less can pay less. So basically we form a network that helps each new, new group. And we support each other with documents, how to set up a legal entity quickly, or things on insurance, or health and safety, or whatever it is. And we all help each other. So there's now 22 of them across the UK. Uh, started off with the first one in Ilford. There was a place in Staines. The council, council offered them an old uh, Toys R Us, but they didn't want that one because it had to close at seven or something. It was on industrial estate. They got an old betting shop. That's called the Talking Tree. They all call themselves what they like locally and run themselves autonomously, but we ask if they could put somewhere in their social media website and things part of the Climate Emergency Centre network. They're all autonomous and independent, but now there are buildings like Seaford's got an old NatWest bank. I've heard of one that's in, in a pizza hut. I think the uh, Swindon is in, in an old uh, River Island. Um, there's a new look in, in um, Guildford. Uh, Plymouth got a two-storey three -story water stones. These are prime spaces in our high street to reach out to people and talk about the kind of futures that we were just imagining and the projects and the solutions. And not just imagining and talking, but physically seeing practical working examples of renewable energy and permaculture or things that we want to you know, create in our communities. Um, so the process is, you know, have a Zoom, start to form a group, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people come together. After the Zoom, maybe there's 20 people in an email list. They might set up a communication group, WhatsApp, Telegram, whatever. Talk to each other. Bring this alliance of groups together. In the next year, hopefully, they've got the legal entity. They find a few empty buildings. There's helpful counsel. Eight out of the 22 centres have been given by the local council, like um, Lewis was opened up by the mayor. And it's a journey. It's a process. You don't always get a building quickly. Some get offered a building within three or four months. Some are still trying a year, a year and a quarter later. If a group doesn't get a building within a year and a quarter, year and a half, the energy goes down a bit. But for instance, like Lewis, lovely success story, a few stories around the network here, narrative storytelling. Um, so Lewis got given an old shop, opened up by the mayor in a full chain and a razzle-dazzle and, you know, lovely. And then um, they told me about seven, eight months later, the roof fell in. So they were a bit gutted, you know, a lot of work, it was an old building. And then I didn't hear from them for a little bit. And then spoke to them a few months later. And they said, oh, we've got been given like a three-story grade two listed building by the council in the middle of town. And they had a beautiful opening and lots of people and music and, and stalls and, and, and stuff going on. And all ages of people. The idea is to get young and old cooperating, working together on these spaces. Um, so how the network supports each other. Every Wednesday we have a Zoom where we either have a support session, people come in and say, we're, we're trying to work this out, how do we do that? Or do you know how we set this up? Or anyone got an example of a volunteer form or how to deal with the council? Uh, we have a Telegram group, we have a WhatsApp group. We do webinars about different subjects that help and we put that on YouTube. If you check out climateemergencycenter.co.uk, there's details on that. Um, and, you know, we're there to help and support, really upscale and accelerate this process of getting spaces. And particularly, really, really, really hope people work on focusing on the solutions. All of our movements for many years have actually been talking about solutions, like you see many here at the Green Gathering. But the media quite often focuses on what we're anti and what we're against. But they don't tell you that we're actually, we might be anti or, but we're, pro renewable energy and we're pro living in harmony with nature and living low impact and living sustainably and the solutions are already out there there are thousands of solutions but we need the physical spaces 
to set up and, and, and have those spaces and get organized. Um, so they're, they're now spread around the country. There's about, like I say, 22 physical uh, spaces from Staines to Kingston to uh, um, Lewis and Seaford, down to, down to Totnes, uh, uh, up to Preston, you know, groups all around the country. Northampton, uh, Colchester got one a while ago. Um, Leeds just opened up, got one. on. The, it's on the seventh floor. They really want one on the, on the high street. But it's a magical thing. Once you get one property, you're in this strange property club and other property owners trust you and they will give you the next building and the next building. Mainly because you're saving them money and that's what they like a lot. But actually, there's another thing called environmental social governance, and that means you're doing a lot for the environment. It's good for that company. They can say, we've helped set up you know, this environment community centre. Um, so anything more on the process setting? Finding. So there's 10 steps. One is build your team. So you just start with five or six friends. Tell we're going to have a Zoom in a month. You get 10, 15, 20 people together. We explain the concept with some slides. Uh, putting pen to paper is, is writing down this is our group, we want to be the Leamington Spa uh, Climate Solutions Centre, and you, you write down a brief of what you want to do. Uh, maybe you set up a website, social media, that kind of thing. Gather your resources, whatever that is, you know, people, equipment, things that you're going to need, uh, setting up, you know, digital resources and things. Finding a space is as simple as getting out on your bike, like we used to do for many years, and just looking around. You, you can do a survey of the empty buildings, there's an empty school there, there's a... Debenhams there, there's a, you know, there's a, a betting shop there. Make a list, find out the exact address. You go to um, uh, Land Registry and you can generally, 8% of the time, find out who the owner is and then you can start to try and communicate with them. But the best route is to try and work with your local council uh, and what gets things moving a bit quicker is, you know, uh, try and find out who the estates manager is, the property manager or the climate policy officer or the environment officer make a friendship with them, keep ringing them. Their job is to help do things on the climate and the environment, so they might help you understand who's who in the council. Like when we did the Preston one, Deb's a lovely lady, amazing. She'd been, and her group, uh, big up the anti-fracking nanas. Um, she, they'd been doing stuff for a year, uh, about a year, trying to get a building. They had the mayor of the council shaking a hand, going, uh, sorry, leader of the council, Matthew Brown, I think, shaking a hand, saying, great idea, yeah, 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 let's, you know, let's make it happen, but nothing happened for a year. And then we did a Zoom with them. Um, from, we run a charity called Space Generators as well that helps groups, liaise and negotiate leases and things and stuff. So we did a Zoom with them. And um, the new climate policy officer, uh, he'd only been in the job two weeks. So we said, look, we'll make you look good if you help us to find this building and we'll show there's lots of climate stuff going on in town. Within two weeks, he'd found the owner of the building that Debs wanted. He got back to us. He'd spoken to the business rate department. He got them to say, yes, we'll give the 100% and there was a draft lease on the table within about a month. Some of these concepts seem more complex, but they're not when we all help each other as a group and a network, and we've got people who can help you to do that. So, you know, step five is meetings and self-organizing. Decide how you want to run your group. Everyone's autonomous. Independent, we come from a very non-hierarchical, circular way of organizing with coordinators and things, but, you know, I think the old expression, a pensioners group in Plymouth might want to run it different to a mum's group in Manchester or whatever it is. So... You're all autonomous, decide how you want to do things. Um, organizing your space. If you had an old school with 10 rooms, you, I mean, you could start small with like a, you know, a betting shop size or whatever, and then move to medium and, and large and, and, and as your group evolves and you go on. Depends how experienced your group is. But even if you get a five, bed, five room place, you start with one room, you have a cafe with cups of tea, another room for an art space, and then you gradually move into the other rooms bit by bit by bit, or the other floors. Um, there's a list when we do this with a slide presentation, coming towards the end of this bit now, and there's, then there's questions and answers, um, of organizing a space and what you can do there. It's just a, a wish list, really, of all the things we've done in centers over the years. And, you know, that is, you know, here's a list of 20 things you could do in your empty building. You know, the main community hall that can be hired out, the, you know, talks, workshops, meetings, whatever it is, community fridge, bike repair, computer repair, dance classes, yoga, you know, kids area, whatever it is you want to put into your building, there's a space or a room there, or you can gradually expand to them. Um, networking and outreach, you know, reaching out to as many different groups as possible. It really is about alliance building, basically. Um, as I say, with the tipping points, it's absolutely critical now that we get out there and, and get doing it, because, you know, 
it's absolutely critical. So many tipping points happening. And, you know, there's already established many groups in your town or city that are already doing a lot of this good work. There are community centres you might be able to link with already. Maybe you can use their space to have a meeting. And then gradually identify the empty buildings and get other places. Like, let me give the, the, the Lewis example again. They, uh, they worked with some of the Zoo Suit Studios crew. They had an old bus station with a kind of cafe room. So they had the meetings there initially for three or four months. Then they got the offer of the um, shop from the council. Um, Leeds, you know, they, they opened up a little while ago. They got the seventh floor of a, of, of a big office block looking over the whole of Bristol, beautiful, uh, sorry, of Leeds. Beautiful views. The leader of the council came and spoke. The dean of the university, sorry, assistant dean of the university came and spoke. And, you know, very, very supportive. And they had, you know, transition towns and recycling groups and permaculture groups, all with stands and stalls. You know, buzz of energy at the beginning. So what we're talking about here really is the, something in a phrase we've made up called the intelligent reuse of the vacant property, you know, empty building infrastructure in every town and city. So it isn't just about one building, one climate emergency centre, one climate solution centre, one eco community centre. It is about us getting this concept across that these are wasted resources. And if you get one community centre building, you might get a shop in the centre, maybe get a community centre building a little bit further out. Maybe you, in time, this is over a few years, maybe you can get a warehouse building. There's tonnes of empties all over. And that empty warehouse could be used to recycle and reuse and build this circular economy. There's a lot of talk and discussion about the circular economy. But this is the physical infrastructure of how to have spaces to build this circular sustainable solutions economy that we all want and are part of and are dreaming and are building in many places but we need more of these spaces so um so the last couple of sets really health and safety there's a whole section there on people how they do their health and safety there's some of the bits that people struggle with uh, getting insurance but there's guides in the handbook uh you know health and safety there's experts who can come and help you but there's guys to help you with bits of that this is the climate emergency center handbook uh in event of emergency break glass and open handbook we are in a in emergency ladies and gentlemen you know um as greta thunberg says our house is on fire our house is on fire and speaking as a grandson of two dublin fire station masters and um, my dad was in the marines and my mum was a nurse really is about taking action steaming in and doing something my mum's side's all about looking after them the community center my dad's side is like get in there and do it quick it really is. Our house is on fire. We've all seen the news recently, you know, the wildfires burning from California to Rhodes Island to, to, to all over, you know. We are reaching all of the tipping points. But there are more sustainable futures possible if we have the spaces, the time, the energy, the resources, and the attitude of cooperation amongst all of us across the spectrum of our society, including, you know, from the politicians, you know, to the paupers, to the, you know, everyone together, Baronesses to beggars, you know, we need absolutely everyone cooperating and working together. We need land, we need buildings, we need space, and we need to focus on the solution. So, last five minutes or so before we go into questions. Um, there are so many of these spaces out there, and, you know, it's great to see that all these groups are doing it and setting up in their various different ways and the different sizes and, and spaces and what they're doing. Lovely group got in touch from Carmarthen. They've uh, rung up about their pound land that's empty, and the group that's in there uh, that owns it said, this is a brilliant idea. We love it. We've got buildings up and down the country that we would like to give to groups. You know, it is an idea whose time has come, and it's really important, and maybe over the next so many years, we can have 30, 40, 50 climate emergency centres. They're all autonomous and independent, but they can work together. Imagine if 50 climate emergency centres on a network all went out for one weekend and planted 1,000 trees. That's 50,000 trees in one go. A lot of the groups are starting to adopt their local river or do river cleanups or, or things like that, you know. So we're all autonomous, we're all independent, but how do we work together? How do we cooperate? How do we work with this, not just nationally, but internationally? If our groups get in touch after the Guardian article who want to cooperate with us and set ones up in their countries and things, you know. It's absolutely critical that we get these spaces set up really, 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 really fast. Um, we also linked to something called Land Climate Emergency Centres. So there's about five or six now. People have got bits of land. They said, I like the idea of that. This could be a Land Climate Emergency Centre. Uh, so people from the city can go out to the country, 
help them build or make or plant or dig or make things, learn about permaculture, plants and trees, whatever, so us city kids can go out and get into a bit of nature, and then also things can come back from the country and the nature back, you know, bring back some food you've helped to grow or whatever. We have to share the land back. We have to live sustainable. We have to stop consuming so much and start sharing a lot more. And we have to very, very, very fast focus on the solutions. These centers are climate solution centers. We call them climate emergency centers to ride the wave of recent protests that we, a lot of us have been part of. And, you know, it's very important to protest against things, but it's also very important to put as much or even twice as much energy into the futures you want to see and the solutions you want to see. And we need to do that very, very, very fast. So in conclusion, really, if you want to find out more, there's climateemergencycenter.co.uk. I think it's Climate Emergency Centers on Facebook. Um, we've got a Telegram channel. We've got a WhatsApp. We, you can email us at climateec at gmail.com. That's climate with two E's, climateec at gmail.com. Um, and, you know, we're all autonomous, we're all independent, but we work together to try and help each other. Um, and what else to say in conclusion, really? You've got to have hope. You've got to have hope. Uh, Mum and my daughter said, and my daughter gave her a book, Hope in the Darkness. It's about the, um, it's about the French resistance during World War II. And they said, if, if the French resistance had given up hope, where would we be now? And we know it's bad, and there's a lot of terrible things and facts that more as an activist for 30 years it grinds you down you see how bad it is for the environment and tipping points and there's a lot of doom and a lot of you know some younger generation think why do we why, why should we bother i mean we're uh, anyway aren't we however every single action you take now makes a difference every single project you set up every bit of recycling every conversation you have every you know new thing that happens that's a bit more sustainable the less you consume, the more you share, the more we have these physical spaces to set up those talks, workshops, meetings, and projects that we all dream about, then, you know, it makes it just a little bit better for us and for our future generations. You know, when, when we started, you know, back in the 90s, Twyford Down, early road protests, you know, we knew, you know, the pollution was bad and, and things were going, but gradually we found out how worse and worse and worse and worse it is. But every single action makes it a bit better for, for future generations. And also for us, we saw it when we were younger. Big up, Theo, sees the day. Um, we thought, like, in the future, this was going to happen. This climate scenario is off 10, 20, 30 years in the future. But it's not. It's now. And it's not off in some other country somewhere else and not going to affect. It's affecting us now. I think one of the biggest, well, actually a couple of years ago, came to festivals and Stratford Tube was flooding. Stratford, East London, four foot of water pouring down the tube and Holland Park in West London as well, massive flooding. You know, they, we've had the hottest Julys in time in records and things, you know. It's happening to us in this country now. It's happening even worse for lots of people over the world. We've got to see beyond all borders. We need to set up these physical spaces, climate emergency centers, climate solution centers, get your teams together, get your alliances of groups in your town together. We are the ones we have, we have been waiting for. You know, you actually, uh, somebody in a beautiful place a little while ago, government's not here to uh, come and save us. We actually had a meeting with um, government department, which will remain nameless, uh, about eight months ago. And we had some big experts with us, last little summer, uh, before questions and answers. And um, including a guy who wrote the, helped to write the Jeremy Corbyn Green New Deal, and brought him in on the meeting and a couple of other experts. And we came away from this meeting with the government department and they went, oh my God, they don't know what they're doing, do they? Like, we said, have you got any funding? To No, we haven't got any funding. Have you got any direction from higher up? It was, and they went, no, we haven't really, no. It was like, well, okay, yeah, uh, great. You know, government is not coming to save you. There's good people within government, within council, locally, everywhere. We have to accelerate getting these physical spaces, get everyone working together, and focus on the solutions very, very fast, and it gives us and our grandchildren a much more chance. Let's think like the Native Americans, seven generations ahead. And let's build the infrastructure now for those beautiful futures you imagined here early on at the beginning. So keep networking, keep positive. You always got to have hope, even though you get a bit grumpy and down sometimes, like me. But keep networking, keep positive. Check out climateemergencycenter.co.uk uh, uh, and get involved. Contact us if you want to spot an empty building. We'll all help each other through the process. 
let's get those buildings open up and bits of land and build the sustainable futures we want to see. Check out the Climate Emergency Centre handbook, what I wrote, and uh, network climate emergency centres.co.uk. Centre.co.uk. Hey. Activities like urban activities like skateboarding and other sports like that. So okay. I, I'm trying to think about an approach that would be also encompassing natural shit ways, natural ways, do you know what I mean? So, mm. it's, so it's not against, the, you know, using lots of concrete and all these other things. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Hempcrete. Yeah, that you want, so you want to build more sustainable skate park and yeah. project there. Have you got ideas on a building or a space? Yeah, well, or? There's a group that I'm uh, working with called Multi Activity Hub, anyway. But what are they called? Like a bit closer? Tell them. Multi Activity Hub. You got a website? No, not at the moment. It's just a Facebook oh. group. But um, we're just trying to get people together as well. And it's similar, but I'm just wondering if it's relevant to this one because it's sort of it's it's it's. Uh, the idea is to have a mixed space for different sports and arts and activities and stuff like that. So I'm wondering if you had any idea about an approach in, yep. that, in that respect, just, but also trying to basically be environmental as well. Okay. Do you know? Um, so, yeah, what, what to say, these projects are about... They're about community and environment and social and environment. It's not just like the environment's off there in some separate box environmental and social crisis have environmental and social solutions and we need those groups to cooperate like the swindon group is actually like 20 community and social groups and then about four environment groups are very strong there um for many years you actually kind of hit the button now or something two things that most of the people who came to our centers for years young people the under 25s asked us when we said what do you want well, get involved come on in what do you want and they said we want um we want a recording studio so we can record our raps, this, that, and the other. And we want, um, we want a skate ramp, or a skate park. So we'd say, get some marine ply and bend it, and you can make... So it, this is a recipe whereby your group, if you link with a few other community social environment groups, could identify maybe an old empty school that's got a big playground, and you guys go, can we have the back half for, for a, a back quarter and whatever, for a half pipe, quarter pipe, and build the skate park of your dreams. We actually did one at the Hive in Dalston on one floor, just made out of... a. Uh, Wood and stuff. So, yeah, it's all possible. You can link up with groups. Pembrokeshire. Yeah. You're not near Carmarthen? Yeah. Right, they're getting a pound land in town. I'll link you up. And then find other buildings and find one that's appropriate with a big yard and, and build the skate park that you want and put some environmental into it. Try and use some sustainable reused timbers, hempcrete, whatever you can. Get a flyer and contact us. Surprise her. Nice job. What's your name, fella? Liam. Liam Phoenix. Phoenix. Nice job. Has anyone managed to successfully do like noisy stuff? In, not necessarily on the level of like raves, but for example, drum practices. If a group wanted to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question, and it does come up quite regularly. Uh, so, at the very centres we did music was at the heart of them. Whether it's, you know, uh, my mate Lord Eric Sugamugu used to come to the Rainbow Centre and, and, and master drummers of Africa, they come in, lug in 10 big, big drums like that and practice on Friday night. That was a big old church, so it could cope with the sound. You have to check your neighbours. You have to think about soundproofing. You have to think about basements. You have to think about uh, when you're legal, you have to think about um, you're allowed to play amplified music up till 11 o'clock. After that, you need a temporary events notice. Be respectful of your neighbours, like, you know, the things I just said. Um, we had at the first Ilford Climate Emergency Centre, which is a massive old home base, uh, had a railway track behind it. We had samba bands come and practice. Uh, Sam and the kind of Brazilian back to axe lot. And, um, so, yeah, I think you might be mentioning samba particularly for certain reasons. Um, yeah, basically, you can do it, but it depends on the building, depends how close to neighbours, and depends how much hard work you're willing to do on lots of mattresses, soundproofing and proper soundproofing, you, you could do it, yeah. And, and, you know, music is the heart of bringing people together. You can do an art exhibition, you get 30, 40 people. It's one of those facts of life, you put a DJ in the middle of it, you suddenly got 120, 150, 200 people turn up. Have, um, have you or people that have been doing it found there's been much passing trade? I mean, you mentioned Poundland, so like people can walk past on the street and they might see what's going on here, or maybe people even saying what's going on here, and then people just coming in and being curious and you know you get much more of a ground squirrel. has that 
Have you experienced that or, or heard Well, that? you've hit on a key point that I should have mentioned in, in, in the chat through, yeah. It, footfall is really, really, really important. And although all different shapes and sizes of building you could get, if your group begins, you need to really get something in the high street, in central, where you get higher footfall. If you get somewhere further out on the edge of town, like a warehouse in industrial estate, it's much harder to pull people in than it is if you're, you know, next to the, you know, if you're taking over the old William Bill, Hill betting shop or the Pizza Hut or the Nat West Bank or the River Island or the New Look, you get hundreds more passing trade. Plus also, it reaches out to everyone. Mums and kids coming past, students, builders on the way home for work, whatever it is. So, yeah, it's important to try and find a good location, location, location. Find, find a good location on the high street. And it does affect it. Like the first one at Ilford, it was much, we were in a big warehouse space out further on the edge. And coming out of lockdown, it was a real mission to get more people coming because it was further out, East London. And it was, you know, but we did it, you know. Also, I guess there's the value of social proof as well. If people just see, wow, there's all these people in a building just you know, voluntarily doing this stuff, it, it makes a big difference to people's perception of what it is to get involved. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if people come past the, the opening days are quite a buzz, actually, on these places, because everyone comes for an opening and, and you've got lots of displays and things. But if people come past and see a buzzing, happening place that they can go in, have a cup of tea, you know, we're social animals and, and we all get lonely. We're all moved into our smaller flat boxes. It's really important to have community spaces to meet. And, you know, one of the best things we always try to do with all the community centres, when someone comes in new, hey, hello, be friendly, be nice, be welcoming. We've always all been that lonely other person sometimes or whatever in certain situations, and we need family, community and tribe. So welcome people in, get them involved, have a cup of tea, biscuit, slice of cake. Two weeks later, they're helping repair bikes, do a shift in a calf, whatever it is. We're all part of the tribe. Let's get together and take action. My love. Hello there. Um, have you had many people saying, well, this side of COVID, our building's really not working for us anymore. Mm. And actually, is there an opportunity to use it in a way that's much more um, helpful to the local community? Um, I work for a social, non-profit social care organisation. Uh -huh. uh, through COVID, the building was really important one side. We're all hybrid working on this side. Um, actually, the building could be used in a much better way uh, for the benefit of the local community. And this seems like a really good idea. And I just wonder whether mm. it isn't about going... There may be loads of organisations are saying, well, actually, our building is working for us now. Actually, as a climate emergency centre, it could be and actually engage in the community more. Yep. Uh, so it's just a different strategy for getting empty buildings. All the strategies and tactics we need to deploy above us. Uh, let's chat after. But basically, uh, what you mean is if a group already has a building, yep. um, could it... I mean, on one level... There are groups, there's about four groups that have already linked up already that have been centres running for 10, 20 years. So, for example, the, um, uh, the Umbrella Centre in Northampton, they've been running for many years. They do something called the Umbrella Green Fair type thing. They said, we love this idea, can we join the network? There's another group in Hull, lovely guy called Alan. They've been repurposing and reusing empty buildings for 20 odd years. They've had about 70 buildings over that many years or something or whatever it was. He's over 20 years, 30 years. Uh, lots of buildings. And he said, can we join? We love the idea of this. There's another group in Colchester. They, again, run the local green fair. I went down to talk there. They've now got two or three shops on the high street that they've been fixing up and, and opened up. Um, groups can, yes, basically say, we tell them, you know, to find your own building takes a bit of time. Maybe there's an established centre that needs a bit more energy. You could work with them. So work with the terrain that's there already, maybe a group could come and start having meetings in your building yeah, yeah, yeah. and it could re-energise your building and together you could work to find other ones. It's not just about one building, it's getting this infrastructure of a few, but yeah, by all means, cooperate with groups already there. If any groups know about buildings existing that could be used. A lot of groups need a space to have a meeting initially. And a lot of um, you know social care organisations are supporting people who are really quite marginalised, quite isolated. You know That gives them a path straight back into being the centre of the community and builds community around them. So That leads on to a good example of Swindon. <coughs> so Swindon covers a couple of bits and the last question a little bit there as well. Thank you, that's a really good one. Um, so Swindon, I rang the guy originally, he's from Environment Group, and said, look, uh, one of our trustees from Space Generators were talking to the owner of Debenhams through another property group that we were already had some arrangements with. 
And uh, he said, maybe the Devons could be used, maybe it could be, maybe we could get you like the River Island building, because they owned it. And um, the guy I rang from the environment group said, look, he said, there's only about four environment groups that do a lot in Swindon, but there's like 20 social community groups. And they have gone in and they filled that old River Island, you know, not only like River Island, River Island, with tons and tons of activities, but they're more community and social activities than they are environmental. Um, the property agent that we know that um, is linked with there, he said they've improved footfall on the high street. It's better for all the local shops. There's more people coming back into the high street, which was struggling because they all gone to the internet. And when I went down to visit, it's beautiful. The afternoon manager guy showed me around, and, and basically they work with a men's mental health shed group that basically does recycling furniture. He said, what's great about here is we're the kind of cheapest coffee in town and when we're open you get the old people sat there and chatting and then we've got a pool table for the youth and they all come in after school and they're doing that and then literally they had about four or five or six charities that are working locally with social and other issues. He said they've got refugee groups that come in and they hang out during the day. So you're kind of cross-pollinating and mixing those groups and bringing them back into the high street they would be sat at home, in, you know, sometimes with various situations going on, when you can come and meet other, other, other people and you've got refugees mixing with grannies and granddads, mixing with youth, mixing with people with all, you know, getting together. That's really, that is community to me. It's a beautiful picture of one, one they had a dub reggae night in, um, in Swindon and all playing and there's a little cute four-year-old and then there's some old, you know, older people. And there's just a shot of the room that used to be just filled with curtain rails of clothes. And there's just like 40, 50 people there of all ages, all cultures, all background, all races and ages s just chatting on about 10 different tables. That's it. That, that's community to me. It'll give me a little buzz and a little tingle. That's what we do it for. We don't do it for the money because no one's really given us any money for this. We're running on a bloody phone bill. So anyone wants to help us with funding, uh, resources, equipment or wants to help with a network, we always need help. You know, we need these spaces. So if there's groups that you know, let's work together and help each other. Over. Any last questions? If not, I'd just like to say, Phoenix, thank you. That was hugely <laughs> inspiring. And the whole thing of the climate emergency centers that I've come across is just where it's at. Local activism, making stuff real, getting people to smell the future. Oh, beautiful. There's about another five or six, seven in the pipeline coming close. If you want to set one up in your area, get in touch with climate emergency center, uh, .co .uk, basically website and um yeah get, get in touch climate emergency centers.co.uk thank you very much for listening keep networking find a space in your community take action for solutions <laughs>